Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Schulson. I am the Senior Vice Provost for Academic Affairs at the University of Connecticut, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second event in our Provost's Distinguished Speaker Series for the 2021-2022 academic year. This series is an annual, is, this series annually features our recently appointed Board of Trustees Distinguished Professors and endowed chairs to share their scholarship with us. We're extremely pleased to host this opportunity to bring our community together in appreciation and celebration of the exceptional work we do at UConn. I would be remiss not to acknowledge the work it takes to arrange the series, which has been managed ably by Amanda Pitts in our office in partnership with my colleague, Vice Provost Michael Bradford. I want to thank Richard Wilson for sharing his scholarship with us today. We've asked the School of Law Dean Ebony Nelson to introduce Professor Wilson and his talk, Free Speech, Hate Speech, and Human Rights. Before I turn things over to Dean Nelson, though, I do want to acknowledge some of the other special guests that we have today, Gary and Phyllis Gladstein. The Gladsteins are generous supporters of UConn and in particular of our human rights activities. Indeed, Professor Richard Wilson holds the Gladstein Distinguished Chair in Human Rights, established in 2005 by the Marsha Lillian Gladstein Foundation. Gary is a proud UConn alum and has strong ties to the university, having served as a member of the CLAS Advisory Board, the UConn Health Board of Directors, the Governing Board of Hillel, and, direct, and, and director, is Director Emeritus of the UConn Foundation Board. Currently, Gary serves on the Dodd Center Campaign Leadership Committee. Gary has been, a gener has been generous in sharing his time and talent, and without much fanfare, he and Phyllis are among the university's most generous philanthropists. Over the past two decades, the Gladsteins have supported programs across the university, including the founding of the Human Rights Institute. Their giving, challenge match, giving and challenge match gifts to the Human Rights Institute have inspired others to get involved and partner with the university to make an impact in the field of human rights globally. Thanks to their partnership, UConn has attracted stellar human rights faculty across the disciplines, and our graduates go on to secure meaningful work in academia, law and government, business, the health sec sector, and STEM fields. Thank you both Gary and Phyllis for being here today and for all you do for UConn. Now it's my honor to invite Dean Nelson to, in, to introduce our featured speaker today. But before I do that, I want to add a few words about UConn's newest Dean, Ebony Nelson. Dean Nelson joined us in the spring of 2020, having previously been on the faculty and served as an associate Dean at the University of South Carolina Law School. Spring 2020, as we all remember all too well, was hardly the most auspicious time to begin a new high profile administrative position with COVID-19 disrupting just about every aspect of university life. And nevertheless, in the spirit of her former mentor and teacher, Elizabeth Warren, she persisted. Stepping right into the role with all the poise, wisdom and skill one might have expected of, of a far more experienced administrator. Dean Nelson has already begun to institute important changes to the school, making it a more equitable collegial place, and she has spearheaded efforts to expand its academic and community profile, including most recently the establishment of a new center for community safety, policing, and inequality in the law. By its title alone, I'm sure you will all agree how timely and important such an intervention is. It's been an honor and a pleasure to work with Dean Nelson, and I couldn't be happier to have her as a colleague. Dean Nelson. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. I really appreciate those kind words. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my honor to introduce Professor Richard S. B. Wilson. Professor Wilson is the Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Intellectual Life at the School of Law, Gladstein Chair of Human Rights, and Board of Trustees Distinguished Professor of Law in Anthropology. In 2003, he founded the Interdisciplinary Human Rights Institute at UConn and served as director for 10 years, during which time the, instituted, the Institute hired 10 faculty members, held several international conferences that led to edited volumes with Cambridge University Press and launched an undergraduate human rights major, a graduate certificate and an LLM in human rights. Professor Wilson is a scholar of human rights and the author or editor of 11 books on international human rights, humanitarianism, truth and reconciliation commissions, and international criminal tribunals. He wrote the definitive 
ethnographic, excuse me, study of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission entitled The Politics of Truth and Reconciliation in South Africa. His book, Writing History in International Criminal Trials, was selected by Choice in 2012 as an outstanding academic title in the law category. His latest book, Incitement on Trial, Prosecuting International Speech Crimes, explains why international criminal tribunals struggle to convict individuals for inciting speech and proposes a new model of regulating hate speech and incitement to genocide. His work has been translated into Chinese, Danish, Italian, Portuguese, Serbian, Spanish, and Turkish. Having received his Bachelor of Science and PhD from the London School of Economics and Political Science, Professor Wilson held full-time faculty positions at the Universities of Essex and Sussex in the UK, as well as visiting professorships at the Free University Amsterdam, University of Oslo, the New School for Social Research, and the University of Witzwatersrand, South Africa. He has held prestigious fellowships from the Russell Sage Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. He is committed to bringing scholarly findings into policy discussions and has consulted for various international agencies, including Conciliation Resources in the UK and UNICEF, and UNICEF in Sierra Leone. He served as chair of the Connecticut State Advisory Committee to the US Commission on Civil Rights from 2009 to 2013 during which time the committee focused its attention on the achievement gap in Connecticut's high schools and racial profiling in police traffic stops. In 2021, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont appointed Professor Wilson to a hate crimes advisory council that will recommend legislative changes to improve hate crimes reporting and investigating in the state. Thank you so much, Professor Wilson, for your many contributions we all look forward to your talk discussing free speech, hate speech, and human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean Nelson. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey Schulson, Michael Bradford, uh, Amanda Pitts, and others who put this talk together. Um, it's uh, really encouraging to see so many friends and family. I have two sisters who are listening, and I think uh, I'm most nervous about them because they never really cut me a break. Um, so if I'm terrible, they'll tell me. So uh, fun to see uh, students and former students on as well. And a uh, shout out to Seoul in Cambridge, England. And uh, thanks again to echo Jeffrey uh, Schulson to the Gladsteins for their generous support of, uh, of, of the Gladstein chair and the Human Rights Institute uh, for really a long time now. I'm going to, um, to share my screen uh, so that, um, you can see my PowerPoint and let me know if that's visible to everyone. So uh, this is my talk today. It's on free speech, hate speech, and human rights. <clears throat> and what I plan on doing today is sorry, talking Richard. to you. I'm sorry about, to interrupt you, Richard. Yeah. Do you want to swap the screen again so that you're you're in you're in right now it's it's in you're not in presenter mode. Okay. Uh, do that so, what you did before under the under display settings. Okay, right. Thank you for uh, display settings swap presenter. Does that work? Perfect. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, this wave of incitement and hate speech that we see on social media. What some of its consequences are. And I'll end with some recommendations on what we can do about it. So this all started about 10 years ago when I was working on a book, Incitement on Trial, which came out uh, in 2017. And this book dealt with about 30 cases in which individuals were prosecuted for participating in mass atrocities and genocide in no other way than through their speech acts. So I focused on the Rwanda tribunal and the case of Nahemana, the media, the, the radio station that incited the genocide in Rwanda. Uh, in the middle, you see Radovan Karadzic, uh, the Bosnian uh, Serb president 
who incited his followers to uh, mass atrocities, and then also Julius Stryker at Nuremberg. And what was interesting about these cases was that almost all the observers agreed that these individuals had participated in mass crimes. They had incited their followers to commit heinous atrocities and bore some responsibility. But many of them were acquitted for their crimes. Not the individuals pictured here, but about half of the defendants that I studied uh, the, in the cases that I studied were acquitted. So even though there's a, a strong sense, and I use this uh, quote from Aristotle, uh, going back in Western law and philosophy, that the insider should bear some responsibility for the subsequent acts, it's actually proved very difficult in the courtroom to convict. And the main reason for this, I argue in the book, is that courts are looking for a causal connection between the speech acts and the violent acts. They want to see that the speech act of the defendant caused individuals to go out and commit violent crimes. And in many of these cases, it's quite hard to demonstrate that. It's quite hard to show that but for the words of the defendant, these uh, followers or members of the audience wouldn't have gone out and, and committed these crimes. And something you'll notice about these cases is that they're all old technology, newsprint, radio, and television. And something happened, I published my book in 2017, something happened in the, in the 10 years or so before the present, so in around 2011, and that was social media. So I was very intrigued to understand the relationship between online speech and offline crimes. And what's interesting about social media is that it allows you to track the data at a very large scale. So on Twitter, for instance, you can pull 20,000 tweets in every 20 minutes and examine the language in them for hate speech and then track uh, against the crimes that are committed offline. And this is what these two researchers did in Germany. And they found, uh, Muller and Schwartz found, that there was a correlation between anti-immigrant posts on the Alternative for Germany, which is, sorry, Alternative for Germany, which is a far-right party in Germany. They found that the, the posts on the Facebook site of the Alternative for Germany uh, that were anti-immigrant correlated with attacks on, on immigrants in Germany. Now, this wasn't causation, but they found a very strong correlation. And there was one study after another that came in the wake of this first study, which showed that there was something there, a correlation between online hate speech and offline crimes against religious minorities, against immigrants, against a whole bunch of people. So I was very intrigued by this because I hadn't studied this aspect of, of hate speech in my book. But I got an opportunity to do that when the American Bar Association approached me to, um, to look at uh, a phenomenon they found very worrying. And that was hate speech against human rights defenders around the world. And uh, they argued, and when they approached me, that uh, human rights defenders, and by this we mean uh, civil society activists, as well as judges and prosecutors and attorneys, that they were being uh, attacked and sometimes killed, depending on the country, uh, and that there was a relationship between those killings and the threats they were receiving beforehand. So I worked with a team of students and my colleague, Molly Land. Uh, we had a team of seven uh, Connecticut students, um, and we wrote this report, which the ABA published, Invisible Threats online hate speech against human rights defenders in Guatemala. We focused on one country. And we started with the observation that uh, human rights defenders killed across the world. Here you can see the countries where uh, human rights defenders are killed in the highest numbers are Colombia, the Philippines, uh, Honduras, Mexico, Brazil, and then Guatemala. Um, 
And that in these cases, about 85% of those defenders who were killed had previously been threatened, either individually or as a member of their community. And many of them had been threatened online. So we looked into this and we found on social media a number of different kinds of threats. Here's one of them. For those of you who don't read Spanish, the translation is on the right. Um, the white van informs the prosecutors of the Office of the Prosecutor Against Impunity that your days are number, numbered. And then there's images of a van, a hole in the ground, and a coffin. Now, what you may not know is that in Guatemala, there was a death squad in the 1980s during the military dictatorship that was a white van. So it's clearly a reference back to the old days of military dictatorships when opposition figures, journalists, human rights activists, and others were simply disappeared. 42,000 people were disappeared during the armed conflict in Guatemala, uh, and the, the white van came to symbolize the death squad. So this is clearly sending a clear uh, uh, a message to the uh, prosecutors of this um, of the special unit that uh, that 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 um, they were being threatened, we found surveillance, uh, uh, and and the surveillance wasn't being done in the background; it was being done in the open on social media. So here is uh, Thelma Aldana; she was the Attorney General of Guatemala, and they took pictures of her uh, in Orlando in a in in the toilets of a restaurant demonstrating and then they put it up on online demonstrating their power and their reach that surveillance again is another form of harassment and threat so these are the kind of things we we're looking at and then we wanted to um be more scientific about it and we thought okay let's try and reproduce the analysis done going back to that slide there of the german researchers to see if there's a correlation between online posting by the trolls, by the, 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 the purveyors of hate speech and um, the killings offline. So we did some research and we, we actually failed. Uh, so we, we tracked the average violence by months and we tracked the, the social media interactions of the, um, the far right pro military actors who were doing the threatening and and we found there were there was no correlation. How many times have you heard an academic admit to failure? Uh, I think I should get points for this. Um, but the failure was kind of generated. It was it was helpful. Because that compelled us to turn away from looking for evidence of direct causation, a direct connection between speech act and violent act, to look more broadly at the phenomenon. And there were a number of questions that we thought we might want to answer. So we're studying digital authoritarianism, is what we call it. That is the actions online of uh, authoritarian actors, many of them either state uh, intelligence services, the military in the case of Latin America, or state-aligned actors such as ex-military and, and others. And we thought, okay, if we're not finding evidence of direct correlation or causation, then we turn away from this X leads to Y model of the problem. And we start thinking more broadly about it. We were interested in other questions, for instance, what was the content of the speech targeting human rights activists? We thought it's likely that they're using dehumanizing language, that they're making direct threats. So that was our working hypothesis. We asked other questions. What are the non-lethal effects on human rights activists who are being targeted? Are there psychological harms? Are there effects on their health? Do uh, these online threats silence human rights activists? Do they lead to self-censorship? 
so we 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 broadened out from the causation problem that other researchers had been looking at. And we really wanted to get to grips with these questions of what is the content and what are the non-lethal effects? Those were our primary questions. Let's now look at the question of content. So we coded 400 Twitter posts in Colombia and Guatemala, and we analyzed them. Um, and we found that there were actually a number of different categories of hate speech targeting human rights activists. Of course, there were direct threats, like the one I showed you a moment ago. There were implicit threats, threats that said things like, we hope something bad will happen to you. There were accusations of corruption. There were accusations that human rights activists were, were subversives or terrorists. There were assertions that they were anti-patriotic, that they didn't love their country, that they were criminals. This is similar to corruption, but slightly different, that they're engaging in criminal behavior. Uh, there was surveillance of the type, uh, I put this post up here of surveillance. I showed you the other one of the attorney general in a bathroom. Um, here's another surveillance picture. And again, this is different because past forms of state surveillance were secretive, where they were in the shadows. But what's happening now is that it's being put online as a demonstration, as a spectacle of, of power and the ability to surveil and control. Doxing, which is releasing personal documents or photographs online, we found evidence of that. Also dehumanizing language, that's what we expected there to be a lot of. Uh, gender sexuality-based disparagement, um, and then narratives from the armed conflict, and then finally our catch-all category of stigmatization. So we wanted to understand then more about the content of the speech directed against human rights activists. And here you find uh, the bar charts for Colombia, which is the shaded, and Guatemala, which is the solid line. And there's some interesting things about this. So I'll just point out a few things. First of all, at the very bottom under direct threat, if you can see that, you can find there are many more direct threats in Guatemala than there are in Colombia. And yet Colombia is a country with much higher rates of killings of human rights activists. So perhaps that's why our correlation uh, study didn't work in the way that we, we thought it might. Um, other things to point out is that in Colombia, there are many more accusations of subversion that human rights activists are guerrillas in disguise, that they're Marxists, that they're subversives, much more in Colombia than in Guatemala. Criminalization is more or less the same, accusations that they're criminals. If you look just above it, surveillance, there's much more surveillance going on in Guatemala than there is in Colombia. And, uh, and, and there are interesting ways in which there are similarities and differences. And this is an interesting question because social media companies like Facebook and Google and, um, and Twitter, they have one model of content moderation of speech for the whole world. So they use one algorithm for removing hate speech and it applies universally to the entire world. But we see here that actually the character and content of hate speech varies from country to country. We then wanted to know about the interactions between forms of hate speech. This is an interesting question. Sometimes I get asked by social media companies, what are the worst forms of hate speech? And one of the answers I give them is, well, it varies from place to place. It also varies according to context. But here's another way in which it varies, and that is the interactions between categories and what categories go together. So here, if we look at Colombia, you can see the bold lines are 
that posts that include both accusations of criminality and subversion and stigmatization tend to cluster together. Some of the other categories aren't used in that interactive way. Here's Guatemala, which again is different. So there's, there's cultural and historical differences here. In Guatemala, you find that for accusations of criminality go much more with accusations of corruption. And if I put them side by side, you can compare them. They're different. In Guatemala, it's much denser. Most of the hate posts um, have lots of different forms of hate speech in them, whereas in Colombia, they tend to only have one or two. So there are differences there. Does it matter? The honest answer is, I don't know, but I do know that it's happening. So that leads me to ask the next question, why are um, the, the individuals posting hate speech combining categories in this way and it needs more study? So then the next part of our study was to try and find out more about the effects, the consequences of these online attacks on human rights defenders. Lots of scholars have studied the lethal attacks. Is there a connection between hate crimes and lethal attacks or physical assaults? The focus has all been on physical integrity and, and crimes uh, against the person. But we wanted to know more about the, the intangible, the invisible, or the hidden effects of hate speech. That's not something that, that researchers have really looked into to a great degree. So we interviewed 56 uh, human rights defenders in Colombia and in Guatemala, and 92% of them said that they experienced fear and intimidation. So this was the intangible or un, you know, uncounted uh, effect that was most prevalent. 90% thought that there was reputational damage against them, that their reputation had been harmed in some way. 56% of them were taking protective measures. They were taking different routes to their work uh, and, and back and forth to, uh, to the office every day, taking different forms of transport. 54% said that online hate speech interfered with their work. It undermined their ability to simply uh, work in a professional way. 51% said that they saw a connection with physical harms, uh, either themselves or other people. And the, the majority of those responding uh, indicated that in rural areas, uh, violence was most likely to occur as a result of hate speech. Many of them said, I'm you know, a middle class professional. In a in the capital city, I'm a lawyer, or I'm a you know a judge, or I'm uh, you know a, a, a prominent activist. But uh, and they you know I won't be killed. But in rural areas, it's much more likely to happen, and that's where the hate speech has the most uh, effects on physical integrity. Forty nine percent saw that there was a a link between the hate speech online and uh, criminalization of human rights work. And while we visited, we actually visited um, Guatemala and I was planning on, uh, to make a trip to Colombia, which I had to abandon because of COVID, but um, we found in the country literally hundreds of criminal indictments against human rights activists um, that were mostly frivolous. They had no basis, but uh, they certainly interfered with their work and they were constantly concerned that they would be arrested, a uh, warrant would be issued for their arrest. Um, so the criminalization of human rights work is really uh, a, a, a factor that is significant in these countries. 38% um, uh, reported health effects, insomnia, um, you know, just a whole range of, of health effects, uh, anxiety disorders, and, and so on. 26% said that they had uh, been silenced as a result, that they had 
we're less likely to be on social media or to issue a press release or to speak to a journalist as a result of um, online attacks. 18% uh, reported that they were uh, plan making plans to leave the country or had left the country and come back or were sending their family out of the country. And 10% said it had no effect at all, that they just ignored it and blocked it out. So in the time I have remaining, I'd like to give you a, a sense of the flavor of those interviews and give you some of the language um, that the defenders uh, used in describing these effects. So fear and intimidation. Here's a defender from Guatemala. They use the social networks to get influence and to manipulate your feelings and your psyche. They make threats to sow chaos because that's how they control you. These are psychological operations to make you paranoid and they use fear to control you. It's propaganda 2.0. Another indigenous defender in Guatemala said, the harassment and death threats on social media began when I denounced a massacre by the army in my hometown. I got scared about my security and my family's security. They profiled my entire family on social media. Hate speech online is damaging in a way that is very personal and intimate. The threat is on your phone that is right there next to you. And this was a very powerful interview for me because propaganda has been around for a very long time. In politics, there's always spin. Uh, some authoritarian regimes have always engaged in propaganda. But what's new about social media is this aspect that this young uh, indigenous defender referred to. It's very personal. It's intimate. It's in your social networks. It's right there on your phone that you've got there in, in your pocket. So there does seem to be something about uh, social media that makes threats different than a threat that is uh, made in a more public kind of setting. Reputational damage, uh, here's another, this is actually a, a former judge um, in, in Guatemala who said, there was a campaign in the press and social media saying, this lawyer has received uh, 60,000 quetzales, about $7,000 and is rich. It's not true, we took the case pro bono, but it does damage. People read it in the newspapers and ask, why are you a millionaire? The hate starts in one place and then it spreads. Ordinary people, as well as journalists, all start to hate you. People start to make comments in bars and restaurants. My doctor went out with my, my daughter rather, went out with friends who said to her, your father is a thief and a corrupt lawyer. Uh, taking protective measures. Um, one defender from Colombia. Now I use a pager and I travel with someone at all times. This is actually a, a female defender. I, I, avoid, I avoid having a fixed schedule. I tell my family, I'll call you at 5 p.m. And if I don't, then come and look for me. So they're constantly giving their schedule and itinerary to members of their family and checking in with them periodically, the kind of protective measures that they started to take after the online attacks. Another, um, this is a judge in Colombia. I have 24 hour p police protection. It diminishes the risk, but nothing will help you if they really want to get to you. Which uh, really for uh, someone in the law school to hear is uh, you know, very painful because rule of law requires the independence of the judiciary. It, allow, it requires them to go about their duties in a way that is unfettered and uncoerced. And this judge is clearly working under very, very difficult uh, conditions and uh, in fear for his life on, on, a, on a daily basis. Uh, interference with human rights work. When our staff, this is a human rights organization based in Guatemala City, when we go out to the communities, we are sometimes met by community members with machetes saying, we know you from Facebook. You are traitors receiving funds from international sources. Um, the connection with physical harms, these social media companies block your work, ruin your reputation, 
and prepare the ground for taking your life. Hate speech in the United States does not lead to violence. Here in Colombia, uh, yes, because there's not a gap between what is said and what is done. So I won't read many more of them except for the last one, um, which is the no effects category where a defender said, I've been in the struggle for 28 years and I'm in my 70s, so I'm tough. I block them and I don't care what they think. I don't lose sleep. They aren't going to kill me. But younger people are affected. Some are more sensitive to others. And anecdotally, although I didn't survey this, anecdotally, this seemed to come out in the interviews that younger defenders were more affected by online speech than the uh, activists who had been uh, doing their work for, for decades. So these are our findings then to, to summarize our findings and then I'll come to our recommendations and then I'll be happy to hear any questions or comments that you have. There are many other categories of hate speech online other than dehumanization and direct threats. Direct threats get all the attention and in scholarly work, there's a big focus on dehumanization. But in fact, there are many, many categories of speech um, that are used. We need to have a much broader understanding of the ecology of hate speech online than we currently do. The number of direct threats online may not correlate with the level of killings. That is the case in Colombia. Um, there isn't a, a way of, re and in, certainly in Guatemala where we did this, no one has been able to identify that uh, correlation between online speech and, and offline killings. So it may not correlate. It may, but no one has found that evidence yet. There are some cross-cultural similarities in speech that targets human rights activists. They accuse them of being criminals. Uh, there's gender and sexual uh, sexuality disparagement. That was really, really very common in all the countries. And I'm working with um, Jordan Kuyper, who's presently on this call, and he's working in Serbia. And we're finding that those gender dimensions um, are, are very common in, in all of the countries we're studying, referring to human rights activists as homosexuals, as lesbians, as, uh, as you know, um, gender um, uh, perverts as all pedophiles, all this kind of thing is really a baseline that we see across all of these countries. And then implied threats. In fact, the level of direct threats varies a lot in the different countries, but I didn't show it to you, but on our graph, the level of implied threats, we hope something bad happens to you one day, those kind of threats is quite uh, similar in a number of the countries that we've been studying. There are differences, of course, as well. The accusations of subversion and the levels of surveillance, as, as we saw earlier. What are the interactions between these categories and the effects of these interactions? We don't know. That's certainly an area that I'd like to look into a lot more. What about the consequences of this uh, online hate speech against human rights defenders? Well, as I've argued, I think we need to look at, you know, at direct causation, that's really important of physical harms, but that's not the only thing we should look at. There are a range of non-lethal negative effects that undermine human rights work. Fear, silencing, abandoning of the work, fleeing the country. Are these interlocking? How do these actually, um, uh, affect one another. It could be that a criminal indictment has a link to reputational damage, which has a link to health effects. How are these consequences themselves interrelated? Again, we know very, very little about this. The scholarship is just not strong in this area. Um, folks have tended to, because it's really hard to study this stuff, to just focus on one element, but we really need to start to see how the elements are interconnected. Okay, so I'm gonna end with uh, some recommendations. Uh, first of all, I think we need a draft United Nations Digital Code of Conduct for States. 
A recent study by Amnesty International showed that 70 states are using social media for propagandistic purposes inside their country and outside their country. 70 countries are using it. That's uh, a third of all the countries. And this was a couple of years ago, it's a 2019 study. It's likely now that a majority of states have information operations online that are secretive and that target their opponents, journalists, political opponents, and others. I think there's a problem with that. We need to have more transparency. States need to be disclosing more and revealing more than they do. And if they sign up to a digital code of conduct, there might be a mechanism for that. And clearly they need to cease and desist from inciting violence against minorities, religious minorities, ethnic racial minorities, sexual gender minorities, and so on. It sounds kind of obvious. It sounds like, well, why wouldn't they? But it's remarkable how many countries have done this. Myanmar inciting genocide against the Rohingya population. But there are other, there are other examples. Uh, in Colombia, they're inciting violence against the Venezuelans. Um, and so there are a number of states that are engaging in these propaganda ex uh, exercises online. All this stuff has moved online now, and yet there's no regulatory framework at the international level for dealing with it. Social media companies, you need to moderate in Bogota like you moderate in, in Boston. We found explicit death threats online that would be removed. We found them in, in Bogota and in Guatemala City that would be removed if they were made in Boston or New York or Chicago or California. The social media companies have put a lot of money into regulating speech in North America and Western Europe, and the rest of the world is a bit of a wild west. They are not moderating speech and removing direct uh, th uh, death threats online in those other places they need to do so. I'd like to argue that social media companies need to decentralize their operations. You can't have one model for the entire world. They need to set up in-country offices with native speakers, with journalists and policy analysts who know the context and know the content and we need to have more decentralization of the content moderation framework that, that regulates speech. Simply writing an algorithm in Palo Alto is not enough. There's too much variation uh, in speech around the world and all the different languages of the world and also the different contexts. There are some countries that are really at risk. I would say that there's, you know, for purposes of argument, half a dozen countries in the world where there could be an armed conflict outbreak, like happened in Ethiopia this year between uh, Ethiopia and Tigray, um, countries where there's going to be a massive humanitarian crisis, armed conflict, civil war, and these countries should be treated differently. Uh, the hate speech definition should be more capacious. We should have protected groups extended and increased to include judges, prosecutors, human rights lawyers, journalists are already included, but a number of others. So uh, I, I'm, I'm talking with uh, these, com these companies on a fairly regular basis, and I'm making this argument that they need to um, create a bespoke uh, content moderation framework for a few of the countries that are at most at risk of widespread and public violence. And then finally, I'd like to see a challenge to Section 230 of the 1996 Communications Decency Act, which um, means that social media companies, so-called intermediaries, are not liable for any of the content on their platform. This is where I'm in agreement with Donald Trump. I didn't know that that would ever happen, but it happened in this case. He wanted to simply repeal Section 230. I'd like to keep it, but challenge it and permit civil suits against companies that are negligent, that do not meet current industry standards and do not, and I've written some language here I'd like to see in the legislation, do not exercise their duty of care to remove posts that are likely to cause imminent harm.
I'd like to thank for your support, my co-researchers, Molly Land and Jordan Kuyper, Gary and Phyllis Gladstein for your enduring support over the last nearly 20 years for my research and scholarship, the Human Rights Institute and the School of Law, the Research Excellence Program of UConn, which has supported this work, and also Robert and Mary Jane Yass, who've been supporters as well. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to entertain your comments and questions. Thank you, Richard. Uh, fascinating and interesting work. Um, I'm going to take the prerogative of the chair and ask the first question, but then I would invite anyone who has a question to indicate that with a hand in the chat in, in the uh, using the raise hand feature of the of WebEx. Um, so there, there's clearly needs to be a broader. I think your your case is your argument is that there needs to be some kind of broadening of what it what it means to make to to make threats on online to to um, be responsible for hate speech. But once you begin to open that category up, the question then becomes how to draw that line, and especially mm -hmm. in light of what you suggested already, which is that there are cultural differences from one place to another. That strikes me as a particularly kind of challenging task. Um, where, how do you distinguish between accusations of of corruption or ac accusations of of subversion or criminality that may actually be legitimate accusations from ones that are really simply meant to stir up trouble and and put people under uh, under um, uh, under threat in various ways? Sure. So it's a fair question because I don't want to be in the position of the be nice police trying to make everyone nice in the world. Uh, there's going to be a lot of reprehensible and offensive speech. And much of it, we can meet with counter speech. Uh, there's a group um, called I Am Here, run by a former uh, UConn PhD student, Catherine Berger and the Dangerous Speech Project in DC. And it's a counter speech project. So what they do is they simply challenge people who use offensive language online and they say, do you have to use that kind of language? Why are you saying this? I don't agree with uh, the approach you're using and the tone you're using here. Could you say that in a way that was less insulting? And they claim that about 70% of the posts that they challenge are taken down by the poster themselves. If we broaden out our category of hate speech too far, it's likely we're gonna be over-inclusive and chill political speech that we may not like, but the polity and the democratic space requires that we allow it. And I'll give you an example. In 1838, and I know uh, Dick Brown is on this call, so I don't wanna get this wrong. Uh, about 12 states, most of them in the South, um, passed laws saying that the abolition of slavery, advocating the abolition of slavery was a form of incitement punishable as a crime. Incitement laws have been used to punish minority viewpoints for a very long time in the United States and elsewhere. There are some countries where you can't criticize um, uh, the country's history and admit that a genocide was committed against the Armenians, for instance, in Turkey. Um, so we don't want to, we want to have a, a category of hate speech that is narrow enough to protect individuals from harms, but not so broad that it doesn't allow my minority viewpoints and other viewpoints to come in. And I guess my response to you is that the companies need a much more sophisticated system for figuring that out. Right now, they're only looking at the internal signals online. That's all they ever look at. They look at the, the language itself, um, and they go off of that signal. And what I've been trying to say to them is you need to take into account the external signals as well. What is going on in a country? In some countries where uh, in Turkey, 150 journalists are sitting in jail right now. That should be an external signal 
about the conditions of freedom of expression in Turkey. In a country like Colombia, 150 human rights activists are being killed every year. That should be an external signal. So the companies need to, and they can do this. I believe that they have the wherewithal in, in the technological sense to do this. And it's interesting because if we think about what's been done with child pornography, there is simply no child pornography on YouTube. They remove all of it. They are very effective at removing all of it. And so when they focus their minds on a problem, they can solve it. I don't think they focus their minds yet on the problem of hate speech in a way that combines internal signals with external signals to allow speech that may be offensive, but is not going to lead to imminent harm and really try and remove those posts that are most likely to lead to uh, to some form of imminent harm against the target. Thanks. So I see one hand up in the chat. Nadia Humber, if you'd like to take yourself off mute, I think you should be able to do that yourself. You can go ahead and ask your question. Oh, apologies. That was a mistake. I did not have my hand up. <laughs> sorry. I think I meant to just clap for the, okay. uh, sorry about that. I That's know. okay. Anyone else want to chime in with a question? We've got about seven minutes before we uh, we have to call it a day. I've got others, but I don't want to displace other. So, Ebony, I see your 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 hand is up. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you, Richard, for that excellent presentation. One question I had is that when you talk about hate speech inciting imminent harm, are you talking about just physical harm? Because as we know, there's a great deal of mental harm. Uh, that is also done and, you know, we see in the media recently here with regards to social media and what impact that's having on the mental health, particularly of youth. Um, but as you talked about that immediacy and how personal and intimate uh, the, the threats are now um, with regards to being, like you said, in your pocket or sitting at your table. So I was just wondering about that. Uh, are you in favor of stretching how, how broad uh, do you define uh, harm? Yeah, that's a really hard question because I am in favor of stretching the category, but I haven't thought through exactly how that would work in all of the possible scenarios. So clearly I'm interested in in the, the non-physical integrity harms, um, partly because I think all the emphasis has been on the physical harms. At the same time, I think we're at a point where we're simply trying to get the social media companies to pay attention to the type of speech that may lead to imminent physical harm. So I think that's the low hanging fruit that we need to focus on, first of all. And then once we've got that in a place that's acceptable, then, um, then we can expand out to, um, to the, the non-physical harms. I mean, we, we saw this with nearly 40% of our respondents describe some terrible health effects. You know, um, it, it, sometimes when they were subjected to these massive ca campaigns where um, where they may get, you know, 20,000 uh, posts a day against them, um, you know, that, that has effects. Now, there's a very interesting case, uh, Anglin versus Gersh. Uh, I don't know if you know this case. It, it was in Montana last year where um, Mr. Anglin, Andrew Anglin, who's a white nationalist who ran the Daily Stormer website, which was funded by Richard Spencer. Um, he engaged in a, a campaign against Mrs. Gersh, who was a, a, a Jewish member of his community. And she had to move her house twice to put her children in different schools. She was receiving you know, thousands and thousands of death threats a day. And he mobilized his followers on the Daily Stormer website against her. And the traffic was something like 30,000 people going to that website a day. She sued, uh, and Montana is not known as the most um, uh, liberal of states. She won, and the court awarded her $14 million in damages as a result of the emotional harm. Now, that to me is a possible mechanism for, for challenging Section 230, that if it could be shown that um, 
a, a social media platform was negligent in removing posts that um, the industry standard requires that they remove and an individual suffered extreme emotional harm as Mrs. Gersh did, then that would make the companies liable um, uh, you know, to, to damages. So I think, I think there are lots of different mechanisms here and it's a question of how they play into one another. But yes, the short answer is yes, I'd like to see the, the range of harms expanded to include uh, emotional harms as well as uh, physical and identifiable ones. One sorry. of the prob what, sorry, just to finish, one of the problems is is that few countries have the kind of civil damages system that the United States has, and that simply doesn't exist in the same way in um, in Colombia or Guatemala. And you know, the first um, mass torts in South Africa was in two thousand and eight. And so they have had a, you know, a, 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 a meaningful um, civil damages system for about 10 years now in South Africa, and they're ahead of a lot of places. So, um, so I think these, these are tough questions, which really make us think hard about what is the legal environment of, of each of the countries that we're, we're looking at. I think we have time for one more quick question, uh, and I'll just take it in the order that I saw them come up. So, Rachel Chambers, if you'd like to take yourself off mute and go ahead and ask your question. Hello there, Richard. Thank you very much for the talk. I really enjoyed it. This is a quick question about the companies themselves. So I'm thinking, you know, with Facebook's, um, you know, the whistleblower appearing before the Senate committee last week, you know, what prospect do you think that the companies will actually change their ways when we learn about the internal workings of them? And we realize that, in fact, you know, prioritize other priorities seem to be taking the four, you know, in, in, instead of, of these priorities. Yeah. Thank you. So, it's a great question. And the short answer is, I don't know, because it's uh, speculating about the future and about companies. I think there'll be differences in companies. You know, there was a time when I was speaking with Twitter, say, three, four years ago, and they were simply dismissive of all the claims that I'd the kind of research I was presenting to you now, they were simply dismissive of it. They were like, no, we are the free speech platform. And Facebook had a human rights lawyer who was listening very attentively to what I was saying and saying, yes, these are very important questions. So we're going to have to look at this. But then come January 6th, it's Twitter that is much more aggressive and Facebook is taking a hands-off approach. So um, it's very hard to predict there is reputational damage to these companies. And clearly, Facebook are going to have trouble rolling out their Instagram for kids after the revelations of the whistleblower showing that, you know, they knew in their own research that um, girls were having all kinds of body image problems that were exacerbated by being on Instagram. So I think they are taking reputational hits when it hits their bottom line. Uh, and or they are faced with antitrust regulation, then they might focus their minds on it. I, I have to say, I sympathize with them. They're in a difficult position. Um, Facebook has 3.3 billion users across its three platforms of WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, these are very, very difficult questions. But, you know, if I was making uh, $80 billion uh, a year in profits, I, I'd, I'd be able to spend some money on figuring it out. That brings us exactly to five. I see the question that just came through in the chat about the, the availability of the recording. I believe that that's true, though. Um, uh, I think Alexis can confirm that. Um, and once we do have a link, if it's available, we'll be sure to share that. Alexis, is the recording going to be made available? Yes, it should be up in the next day or two on our website. Great. Thank you. So I, I just want to thank again, um, Professor Wilson and Dean uh, Nelson for their uh, participation in this in this event. Um, it was really a fascinating lecture, Richard, and we really uh, learned a lot from you. And uh, thank you all for joining. Have a good evening.